Nina Peterson. So those of you have who have followed me for any amount of time know that I'm a huge Nina Peterson fan. Like this is a woman I would legitimately want to be friends with in real life. Um, Nina P- Peterson is in her early 40s. Uh, she lives in Florida and um, she is the richest sugar baby to have ever sugared. And um, when it comes to Nina Peterson, being a celebrity just for being a sugar baby, you've got to understand that like the Daily Mail.co.uk has written about her. Um, I mean, all kinds of Facebook posts, People Magazine, The Sun in UK, uh, The Sun.co.uk, um, Elite Daily.com, um, Mirror.co.uk, and she's not even like from the UK. This is an African American woman. Um, Nina makes music. She's a mother. It's so funny. People um, speak of her as if she's only a mother of two. But as far as I know, she's got a couple of grown uh, black kids. So her first children, African American, and her second set of children are um, biracial. And this becomes a conversation for divesting because hear me out. Nina Peterson is a dark-skinned woman. I mean, that could have been the end of the video. Nina Peterson is a dark-skinned black woman and is the highest paid sugar baby ever. Oh, and I think she was on Botched. Um, she's got super huge uh, breast implants, so there's that. Um she gives Barbie, she gives very much white man's fantasy, okay? I'm just going to go on ahead and say it like that because honestly, that's okay. Um, <laughs> honestly, that's okay. So you remember that Pamela Anderson type body uh, back in the 90s? And it's crazy because as thin as she is, Babes has booty and that booty is all hers so she still has you know black girl at the bottom but she gives very much you know a white american pen up from you know early 90s vibes okay and honestly y'all that's still a look that's still a look like everyone's getting a bbl now and i really understand that so i i don't criticize like there's a lot of bbl hatred out here and ladies if you've had one like more power to you but at the same time that upper half is going to attract a different kind of guy than the bottom half like for most of my life um i was athletic so i was more known for my bottom half and obviously the bottom half gets you more ethnic men. But now that I've gotten older, I'm incredibly top heavy. Like I can't fit a Nina, a Nina Peterson bra, but like I'm a good GH something in there. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, never mind. I'm, I'm bursting out of a G right now. Um, but like, Here's the deal. When you look at Nina Peterson, and she's had like her nose done, she's had a few lip injections, but like you can see in her face that Nina's a normal looking cute black girl. She's she's a run of the mill cute black chick. And you know in the black community that's not enough, right? In the black community, being a normal cute dark skinned chick is not enough, right? It, it's better to be an unattractive biracial or light skinned woman than to be a cute dark skinned girl within the black community. So part of how she became the wealthiest, I mean, Rolls Royce, I mean, just the way this woman lives, the homes that she owns. And it's crazy because like, people will look at her and see bimbo, but good God, is this woman business savvy? And her voice, she sounds like a total Disney princess. I love the way she sings. I love the way, like when she speaks, like she should just talk all the time. And it's funny because she's a woman of very few words. 
I remember when I did less content, my voice was a lot like higher and less like uh, like that little undertone thing. Um, so maybe I'll take a page out of her book and just stop talking so much. But um, you have to ask yourself, this woman who would not have made a splash in the African-American community has splish splashed all over the UK to the point where they can't stop writing about her. And this is not a woman known for her acting. She likes to sing. It's a hobby for her to sing, but it's not like she, she's not a singer. She's literally a beautiful black woman who found her audience, ladies. That's all she did. She found her audience and she let go of, like I said, her older kids are black. Her older kids are black and, and, and she wasn't, you know, making it then. Right. So so she fought the good fight. The reason I like her as a symbol of divestment is because she fought the good fight. <laughs> OK, she, she did black love before she did anything else. And um, she's got these little beautiful girls. Um, the last time I checked, I think the older biracial girl uh, now identifies um, as a boy Um and the little one is always dressed like a mermaid and they're just totally adorable. Uh, the entire family, and hear me out when I say this because I am very much neurodivergent and proud, they all give me neurodivergent. Um, one of the perks of being neurodivergent is like, we're just some of the sweetest people alive, okay? We're just some of the kindest, most Michael Jackson, most sensitive <laughs> people alive. And a lot of times for men, that neurodivergence on a woman is really attractive, right? So um, there are girls who, you know, are on the autism spectrum and like, you know, their reactions to things, men think it's cute, right? Whereas on a guy, people would be like, oh my God, like what's going on with him? Is he okay? But um, they just give fun, friendly, cuddly vibes, like like all of them, like her and her daughters. Um, but this is about Nina. And um, I don't know, it's just like neurodivergence can actually be a strength because that kind of quirk is it can be really cute when you don't get shade or when you wish somebody well or when you don't want somebody to kill a spider or when you like, I mean, you don't have to be neurodivergent for, for those things. I'm just saying like things that are common for everybody else are not always common for us. And sometimes being neurodivergent will lend to you not only character that the average person doesn't have, but also intellect that the average person doesn't have. And this woman is just, I mean, success in a bandage dress. <laughs> I mean, she just knows what she's doing and there's nothing masculine about her. So many people look at a woman with a mind on her and they're just like, oh, masculinity. And this woman, oh my God, like this woman is so super feminine. I'm telling you, like the way that she moves and speaks, she gives you Disney princess. She doesn't even necessarily give you, you know, the most vixen vibes that there are out there. Like she doesn't give Denise Vanity Matthews, who is also, or God, you know, rest her soul, who was also neurodivergent, right? So, you know, Prince obviously wasn't, but Vanity obviously was. And if you look at a few interviews with Vanity, you can see that she is um, neurodivergent. Um, the character of Hillary, um, Hillary from, whoa, so someone's alarm is going off and it's interrupting me, but Hillary Banks from um, The Fresh Prince, like, of course, she's super successful, super beautiful, but like you can tell in her responses that she's like neurodivergent. I didn't even, I didn't even plan on talking about neurodivergence in this video, but like, um, y'all are my people and I'm your people. So uh, there's that. But anyhow, um, she went to where she was appreciated. And the cool thing about Nina is that over the years, you don't see her getting lighter and lighter. Like sure, her skin color is different in different photos and what brown skin girl doesn't have, you know, different shades and different uh, photos. But like, um, she kept her color. 
And her color is part of her marketability. I mean, when it comes to her being in her 40s and being the silky smooth woman, that's melanin UV protection rays on her body. Like she just looks like a doll. Being a doll is her aesthetic. If it's not your aesthetic, you can definitely find her aesthetic a little bit jarring. But um, all these wealthy billionaires, because keep in mind, she's a, she's a millionaire. So the people who are throwing money at her are more than millionaires. These are billionaires. And she just looks like a normal black girl who went to high school, who was maybe too tall for all the guys. Um, yeah. Um, she's a really uh, attentive mother. And I love that about her because basically with a sugar baby lifestyle, she essentially is a stay-at-home mom. She's a stay-at-home mom. She's constantly, you know, teaching her kids, you know, about the world and who they are. And they're also teaching her about who they want to be. And they have the range to do that because there's so much money. Um, a lot of the men, like I, I listened to her talk about one guy that she was with, but I know this is very normal for her. And she was just like, you know, this man spent $30,000 on me before I was ever intimate with him. Right. And the thing is some women, you know, we like intimacy. Like there are some women who, you know, are prudish, some women who don't like to be touched, but there are some women who are just, you know, they're cuddly, snuggly companions and that's a thing for them. Um, and that's a thing for her and it works for her. But I just wanted to mention her because no white, no non-black, no nothing. There isn't a sugar baby who has done with their lives, who has made with who they are, what Nina Peterson has. She's, she's literally the pinnacle. And you don't have to be 12 you don't have to be you know some little kid so many people you know they think sugar baby they think nothing older than a college student but in reality to me the women who are the most primed and perfect for being sugar babies are single mothers I really do think that single mothers can benefit from being sugar babies just because you know it's a type of relationship where You don't have to see the guy all the time. He's not around you all the time. You don't have to cater to him all the time. Maybe you see him, you know, a weekend out of every month or, or, you know, a few weekends out of every month. Um, Maybe you spend a week together, you know, traveling or something, but like you still get to give the vast majority of your time to your children, both of her kids, like the, the young girls, right? Because her African-American son is grown, um, right? He, he's grown. He's, he's made his own decisions. Um, but her two little biracial girls, their college is completely paid for. And their college was paid for like five or six years ago. And that's only to my knowledge. So these little girls... I mean, I think, how old are her kids? I think her kids might be in their teens now. But like, these girls can go to any school that they want to go to and they're not going to be in the student loan debt that the average African-American woman is because she doesn't have a what? A daddy, right? So she set her girls up for so much success. And while... (sighs) I'm sure there are drawbacks to the lifestyle. It's just that I don't see any. And she's done well to carry herself in such a way to where she keeps what's personal for her personal, right? It's like Issa Rae did with her wedding. Like, you know, nobody knew about it. She wasn't tagging him all over Instagram. She's been with him for a while and, you know, just didn't put that thing out there like that. Um, she's, she's public enough and private enough to balance her life. Most people don't know who, like, the guy she was with, I think they called him Santa. Um, I think she's with other than Santa now, but, like, her and the kids just called him Santa. They weren't, you know, walking around calling him Daddy. Um, And I thought Santa was a cute name for the girls to call him. And um, she does a great job of turning it on and turning it off. 
And what I mean by that is like when she needs to be the sexy, you know, showstopper, she is that. But when she's mom, she's jeans and a blouse. Um, so very decent, very smart. And one of the cool things about Nina Peterson is that she's not like a fight the power black woman. Um, she's not one of these hotepsual, um, woke bead wearing like and there and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but I'm saying there is a certain energy that comes with that and it's heavy and aggressive and she just um like I was telling uh, someone that I've never had a white woman in the world who was my friend except for when I was in kindergarten because I have very social justice warrior energy and I'm trying to shake it but um, it, it's very natural for me to, to care so much. Like my personality is like the song uh, Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson. So, so it's really hard for me to turn a blind eye to certain things. But like I've never had a close white woman friend. And I think it's because I'm intimidating when it gets to those kind of subjects. I, I can be very intimidating when you get to those subjects because I just I don't shy away. I don't hold back. Um, but what's beautiful about her not having my energy in that area is that like she's just an international friend. Like she vibes with everybody like her friends are of and you know, my friends are of all nations, but my friends were also woke of all nations. Right. So, you know, I woke Pakistani friend, woke half Pakistani, half Filipino friend, woke half Korean and white friend, woke half, 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 whatever. Right. Lots of mixed women in my life. I don't know why. Um, but you can be as woke or unwoke or whatever. Like you'll never hear her crying about a race issue. This and that happened. I mean, you would have to directly ask her for it to come up. She doesn't make excuses for herself. And, um, her voice is so charming. Like you don't even, she doesn't need the rest. Her voice is charming. The way she loves on her kids is super charming. And when you see her with these little doll children, like you you just want to support them because it's like they look so sweet. And I think that's part of the neurodiverge look. Uh, they look so sweet. You just want to help them. There, there's something very like even the one who wanted who has uh, decided to identify as a boy, like they they are they're very feminine because they don't have the heaviness they don't carry the heaviness that african american women normally carry when it comes to community and you think of you know the the divesting of you know black men which has been done since you know um loving versus virginia and a lot of people are like oh yeah that black woman that black woman that black woman i'm just like that was a full blood rappahannock woman uh, the woman who was married in the case of Loving um, v. Virginia, where um, anti-miscegenation laws were viewed as unconstitutional, that was a full-blooded Rappahannock woman. So maybe change how you feel about the, the appearances of indigenous people. But uh, black men jumped on that really hard and they became less community oriented and less family oriented and more individualistic as mainstream white culture is very you know individualistic it's not very community centric and um they've benefited a lot from that and african-american women you know for the most part dysfunctional or not they have remained very community oriented and very family and child conscious and so what I see with Nina is her shaking off those weights and the, and the reward was literally millions. The reward was literally a house in Florida, a house in the this and that, a Spanish villa and the blah, blah, blah. Like it just worked out so well for her. And she's nothing but a happy black woman. That's all she is. I mean, I mean, she's a the, the the single mom caricature that they give to you, you know, in the in, on certain areas of YouTube where they act like you're the worst thing that ever happened to life. They act like you're the worst thing that ever happened to humanity is you as a single mother. Well, I mean, fancy yourself a pair of Nina, Nina Peterson shoes. I keep calling her Nina. <laughs> Uh, fancy yourself a pair of Nina Peterson red bottoms. I mean, you can get out of there. It's about knowing your audience. Um, 
One of my favorite YouTubers is Danielle, um, A Lifestyle with Danielle, and she was just saying that black women could learn a thing or two from the Kardashians. Like, once the, once the justifiable righteous indignation goes away, you can see that they understood where their audience is. No self-respecting white man is ever going to touch any of those gr- any of those women except for maybe Courtney, right? Um, it, they, they just won't do it, not if they care about who they are in the white community, but they know that their audience is black men. They know that they can be cultural vultures because of black men, and black men are propping them up in such a way because they're such a fantasy to black men. Likewise, the inverse in the reality is you are that same fantasy to so many wealthy white men. Now hear me out because there are some broke, poor, white supremacist, confederate flag carrying white men who are just going to be like, ew, you know, black women are bad, black women are this and this. Even Eminem had to apologize for things he said about black women in a song. Um, so, so hear me all the way out. I'm not talking about eight mile white men. Um, I'm not talking about, um, you know, backwoods, back country, even though when you're talking ebony porn and highest paid uh, sugar babies in America, sometimes you're talking women who are, you know, black women who are hugging that Mason Dixon line. Um, so when it comes to social mobility, right, because this is not a prostitute. This is a woman who was actually developed. I mean, these these are relationships. These are, you know, four or five, six, seven year long relationships that she has. Like one of the number one things she says that I really like is that, you know, a sugar baby is an asset. A prostitute is a liability. And that's how men see it. And that's why men have so many different words for, you know, this is a jump off. This is a side chick. This is a, you know, this and that, right? This is a wife. This is a mistress. This is a, like, they have different words for it. But something like a sugar baby, a mistress, like, the, these are these are assets. And as much as any wife is an asset. Now, you don't have the position. No, you don't. You don't have the position <laughs> or the rights of a wife as well. You should not. But, like... This is a woman who keeps all of their secrets, all of their sexual kinks on the low, all of their embarrassment. Like she like fits like a garment, right? Like a heavy cloak that is covering up all of your shame for years. And you can't pay her to break her silence because she already has what she wants and needs from them. That's a powerful thing in a man's life excuse me, in a successful, apex, wealthy, A1, high caliber man's life. So I just wanted to share that as a reminder, this Nina Peterson is as black as she can be and literally at the top of the game because she understood the assignment. She knows who her audience is. And for her, her worth wasn't going to be amongst black men. It, it just wasn't going to be there. But that's good for her and her children that her worth isn't there. Evidently, it is. So that being said, I am... Um, I was listening to a conversation the other day on YouTube and I completely, forgive me, I forgot what channel it was on, but uh, some black man said that uh, most black women think like prostitutes and the women had such an amazing clapback. They were just like, well, if we did, we wouldn't deal with you because uh, prostitutes, they don't deal in black men at I mean, like some of the white ones and some of the white Latinas, like they kind of have to and they really don't like to because, you know, prostitutes across the board, like when you get into these documentaries and when you get into these studies, um, I'm the type of person I, I can get lost in a four hour long documentary on anything. It can be on ants, bees, porn stars, prostitutes. It can be on Monsanto, corn. It doesn't matter. High fructose corn syrup. I just go. And all these women across the board are just like, you know, anybody but black men. They don't pay. They try to renegotiate prices. They have, you know, STDs, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they hop, you know. And because, look, I don't want to say too much about that because I was actually going to say some very inflammatory things. Um, And I have to catch myself because sometimes I say inflammatory things and I really don't mean to. It's a credit to neurodivergence. 
Um, but you just, <laughs> they try to insult these women by saying, yeah, y'all think like hoes. Y'all think like prostitutes. And it's like, if we did, we wouldn't deal with you because these women are about their bottom dollar. They're about their bottom dollar. And when it comes to the distribution of wealth, even though, I mean, I'm very happily paired with a wealthy black nerd, okay? I, I am very happily paired with a black man who does not suit any of the divested points about black men. I mean, just just, just none of it, right? But um, we might just be a unicorn with a unicorn <laughs> over here. Anyhow, um, I really wanted to thank and praise and to just shine a light on who Nina Peterson is because I really believe that she is an inspiration um, just by being a dark-skinned Black woman alone who understood the assignment of go and find your audience, literally go where you are celebrated, not where you're merely merely tolerated because that celebration comes with the life that she and her children deserve. And again, you can see that change of, you know, having that all black child to having, you know, you know, changed her preference of men. And you can see the result in the way that her children came out. Right. Um, I'm all for women being with black men, white men, purple men, all men. But definitely what I'm for even more is women knowing where their stock is the highest. And for the dark-skinned black woman, your stock just is not the highest with black men. It's not. And as much as like, I mean, there are certain things that are that are problematic to me with uh, non-black men. But definitely when it comes to men of all, I mean, because people keep saying that, you know, divested women worship white men. And there are so many trash bag white men out there, like uh, Dusty's come in all colors. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to wealthy white men, I mean, I will remind you of um, McAfee and, you know, the Norton antivirus. They were both paired with black women. There's something about not the average white man, but there's something about wealthy, well-bred white men who they, they just end up some way in their, you know, and their psychological development, they have these preferences for these dark skin, unambiguous black women. And that's good for you. That's good for you. Maybe white Mike from down the street isn't good for you. But some of these, like, you might need to save up for a pink pill trip to Italy. You might need to save up for a pink pill trip to France or Spain because um, it's it's just different. It, it, it really is. And even for me, as like, you know, a little brown skin in the middle... I'm not going to hit these men as hard as, you know, Crystal and Charisma will hit them, right? Because her skin is darker and silkier and whatever than mine. And I love that I'm able to say that about a woman who is 48. Like, understand, like, you know, your assets. And there, there's there's so much beauty in your skin. And people who aren't being punked by society get to value that skin. That That's that's their, their perk of being dominant is that they don't have to look at the black skin and imagine that it's going to take some kind of power away from them and their children. Look at Eve and her husband. They don't have to look at the skin on a black woman and worry about how that's going to affect their kids because they're already the most powerful men in the world. So they're free to have organic preferences as opposed to preferences that are influenced by a society that you know sunned them getting sunned by society so you're like oh man you know i have to get my kids closer to the skin color in order for them to have more social mobility well yeah you know some of that is true and valid but when you're with the men who are on top of the food chain you can be blue and and there's so much power in that because the truth is a lot of dark skinned black women who are unambiguous, like they are beautiful. They they are they are beautiful. They just have to go somewhere else and be beautiful because we don't value their type within our culture. It's very sad, but it's very true. And it's like, all right, well now that you're done crying, what are you gonna do about it? And the answer is Go where you're celebrated. I mean, you don't have to be a sugar baby. I'm not a sugar baby. Like, like it's not required. 
You can you can go and just have a you can go be Eve. Go get married. That's that's fine. But your audience, like black woman, I'm telling you, your audience is like. I mean, if God ain't looking out for you in the form of reparations, I, I mean, I don't know what that is. Nina Peterson and her kids, they have their reparations. They have their 40 acres and a mule. They, they have everything they need, and they are socially mobile. And that's probably why she doesn't have a race monkey on her back. So this is with love and celebration to Nina Peterson. She is incredibly feminine, incredibly kind. She's a good friend. She's a good mother. Um, she's just, you know, I don't have those, <laughs> chalk it up to being neurodiver. I don't have those hangups about sugar babies because I, I understand what it is. And I understand the difference of a working girl on the street, you know, getting $40 and, and 10 guys in a night versus, you know, a woman who wants a mutually beneficial relationship and, and there's no romance without finance and she means it. Like, like I get it. So anyhow, um, love and success to all of you. This is a half hour video and it shouldn't be. So I'm up a unicorn and I'm out of here.